Hello Year 8 and welcome to this second extract of Detective Fiction. I hope you're enjoying them so far. This week we're having a look at Agatha Christie's um, famed detective character, Hercule Poirot. Uh, he says French things and he's actually meant to be Belgian. Such fun. And here Captain Hastings, who's his friend, um, asks for Poirot's help in solving a murder. And we're going to be looking at the question today. How does the writer, Agatha Christie, present the character of Hercule Poirot? OK, so have that in mind as we read through together. I told him of my awakening, of Mrs Inglethorpe's dying words, of her husband's absence, of the quarrel the day before, of the scrap of conversation between Mary and her mother-in-law that I had overheard, of the former quarrel between Mrs Inglethorpe and Evelyn Howard, and of the latter's innuendos. I was hardly as clear as I could wish. I repeated myself several times and occasionally had to go back to some detail that I had forgotten. Poirot smiled kindly on me. The mind is confused, is it not so? Take time, mon ami. You are agitated, you are excited, but it is natural. Presently, when we are calmer, you will arrange the facts neatly, each in his proper place. We will examine and reject. Those of importance we will put on one side, those of no importance, poof! He screwed up his little cherub-like face and puffed comically enough. Blow them away! That's all very well, I objected, but how are you going to decide what is important and what isn't? That always seems the difficulty to me. Poirot shook his head energetically. He was now arranging his moustache with exquisite care. Not so, so voyons. One fact leads to another. So we continue. Does the next fit in with that? A uh, merveille. Good, we can proceed. This next little fact? No. Ah, that is curious. There is something missing. A link in the chain that is not there. We examine, we search, and that little curious fact, that possibly a paltry little detail with no tally. We put it here. He made an extravagant gesture with his hand. It is significant. It is tremendous. Yes. Ah, Poirot shook his forefinger so fiercely at me that I quailed before it. Beware, beware, peril to the detective who says, It is so small, it does not matter. I will not agree. I will forget it. That way lies confusion. Everything matters. I know, you always told me that. That's why I've gone into all the details of this thing, whether they seem to me relevant or not. And I am pleased with you, you have a good memory, and you have given me the facts faithfully. Of the order in which you present them, I say nothing. Truly, it is deplorable, but I make allowances, you are upset. To that, I attribute the circumstance that you have omitted one fact of paramount importance. What is that? I asked. You have not told me if Mrs. Inglethorpe paid well last night. I stared at him. Surely the war had affected the little man's brain. He was carefully engaged in brushing his coat before putting it on, and seemed wholly engrossed in the task. I don't remember, I said, and anyway, I don't see. You do not see, but it is of the first importance. I can't see why, I said, rather nettled. As far as I can remember, she didn't eat much. She was obviously upset, and it had taken her appetite away. That was only natural. Yes, said Poirot thoughtfully. It was only natural. He opened a drawer and took out a small dispatch case, then turned to me. Now I am ready. We will proceed to the chateau and study matters on the spot. Excuse me, mon ami, you've dressed in haste and your tires on one side. Permit me. With a deft gesture, he rearranged it. Say yes. Now shall we start? He hurried up the village and turned in at the lodge gates. Poirot stopped for a moment and gazed sorrowfully over the beautiful expanse of park, still glittering with morning dew. So beautiful, so beautiful, and yet the poor family, plunged in sorrow, prostrated with grief. He looked at me keenly as he spoke, and I was aware that I reddened under his prolonged gaze. Was the family prostrated by grief? Was the sorrow at Mrs Inglethorpe's death so great? I realised that there was an emotional lack in the atmosphere, a 
The dead woman had not the gift of commanding love. Her death was a shock and a distress, but she would not be passionately regretted. Poirot seemed to follow my thoughts. He nodded his head gravely. No, you are right, he said. It is not as though there was a blood tie. She has been kind and generous to these Cavendishes, but she was not their own mother. Blood tells. Always remember that. Blood tells. Poirot, I said. I wish you would tell me why you wanted to know if Mrs. Inglethrop ate well last night. I've been turning it over in my mind, but I can't see how it has anything to do with the matter. He was silent for a minute or two as we walked along, but finally he said, I do not mind telling you, though, as you know, it is not my habit to explain until the end is reached. The pressing contention is that Mrs. Inglethrop died of strychnine poisoning, presumably administered in her coffee. Yes? Well, what time was the coffee served? Oh, about eight o'clock. Therefore, she drank it between then and half past eight, certainly not much later. Whereas strychnine is a fairly rapid poison, its effects would be felt very soon, probably in about an hour. Yet Mrs. Inglethrop's case, the symptoms do not manifest themselves until five o'clock the next morning. Nine hours! But a heavy meal, taken at about the same time as the poison, might retard its effects, though hardly to that extent. Still, it is a possibility to be taken into account. But, according to you, she ate very little for supper, and yet the symptoms do not develop until early next morning. Now that is a curious circumstance, my friend. Something may arise at the autopsy to explain it. In the meantime, remember it. Okay. Get ready for the next video, where we're going to analyse this passage.